Hi everybody and welcome to my channel. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. If you're new here, my name is Leah and most of my videos are focused on unsolved crimes and mysteries. If you're a returning subscriber, welcome back. So today we're going to be talking about the Micah Miller case again because I have an update for you. I saw an episode of Crime Stories with Nancy Grace. And I saw she did an interview with one of Micah Miller's really good friends named Shailen French. And I really felt like this woman, she had a lot to say and she had a lot of interesting things to say. I pray for your healing, the circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In the last hours, a 911 call has been released that purports to be Micah near suicide. Her family and loved ones want proof. And I don't blame them. Let me remind everyone, the husband slash pastor has not been named as a suspect. We invited him to join us and set straight the record. He did not respond. But who did respond? A very dear friend of Micah's, Shailen French, is joining us. Shailen, thank you for being with us. Shailen, when did you learn that Micah had passed away. I learned two days ago on TikTok. It went viral and I was laying in bed and I found the video and to those who are in her life group in Kansas where she tried to come back to, to separate from her husband um, in early 2023, um, I shared it with them and we all found out right then and there. What was your immediate thought when you learned Micah was dead? My immediate thoughts went straight to him. I remember the story. What do you mean that by that? She... You felt sorry for him? You felt empathy for him? When you say your immediate thoughts went straight to him, what exactly did you think when you heard Micah is dead? I, after the stories that she had shared with everyone about her abuse, and we all got very watered down um, versions of obviously everything that was happening because when you just meet somebody, you're not going to tell them everything. Um, but we got all text messages when she was leaving that didn't make any sense when she was planning on staying in Kansas and she was planning on thriving. She was planning on making trips, healing, and all of a sudden we heard nothing. It was a, hey, good news. I've been reconciled. My husband's allowing me to come back home. Praise God. It didn't sound like her. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. My husband's allowing me to come back home. He allowed I've, her to come back home. I've been reconciled. Praise God. Okay. The, the abuse that she did admit, what did she say? To me personally, and she did not give explicit details. She mentioned how her husband would watch or make her watch unholy acts. And those are the exact words that she gave to me. When I tried to ask deeper, I didn't get an answer. Were you surprised when you learned Micah was dead? So I'm going to back up a little bit because when we met her, it was in early January 2023. She came to Kansas uh, to live with family and she started coming to our church. When she came to our church, she, her testimony was first off beautiful. She immediately wanted to be in mission trips. She immediately wanted to get involved. She wanted to know everybody. She was adventurous. She was ready to just start a new life away from him. We had conversations about her taking care of her own mental health. We had conversations about her feeling like there was nothing wrong with her, but she wanted to double check. She was so happy to be able to deal with her own mental health. She was so happy to be able to go see a therapist. We were making plans. And then 
in March, March 23rd, 2023, we all got a text message that said, praise, uh, praise God, I've been reconciled. So am I surprised that she's dead? <sighs> yes, because she was so smart and I hope she would escape it. And you could tell she was definitely in fear even being away from him. I don't understand the nature of their relationship when she was 15 years old when she met him. How did she end up mother to his five children from another woman? I am not sure. So when she met us in Kansas, she did talk about um, his children, but the only thing she mentioned was that they were close to her age. Um, she treated them like they were her own. She was very kind to them. She talked about missing them even. But I'm not exactly sure how it even came about that a youth pastor would go after a young teen. She never explained that. But you could definitely tell when she gave us that information that she had gone through church abuse. Question, was he the youth pastor when he met her as a 15-year-old girl? I can't confirm that. I have heard, just like everybody else, that he was part of the teen ministry. Um, I have no information on that. We are learning that the COD cause of death at this juncture is suicide. I'm looking at her obituary written by her husband, who has just been released from his position at that Myrtle Beach church. I, I'm curious to Micah's very close friend, Shayla French, why is the obit about him so much? What, did he write the obit? It looks like it. So I, w I would like to put a reminder out there. I, she left Kansas in March, 20, March 23, 2023. Most of us in Kansas, where she escaped to, have not heard from her since. When we looked at that obituary where it says, I loved, she loved her husband so much, this was not written by her. This was written by a narcissist. It is absolutely disgusting, every single way. Loved her husband so much, told him he was the funniest preacher in the world. Okay, and uh, more and more. Okay. So when the interview was over, um, I found her on TikTok. And you don't often see what happens when the cameras are turned off. But I actually saw a video of her reaction when her interview with Nancy Grace was over. And it was devastating and heartbreaking. And you could really, really tell how close she was to Micah. Look at this. Shailen and Micah, they had only known each other for a few months. But when Micah came to Kansas and started working in the new church, Micah and Shailen, they just connected straight away because they both were dealing with traumas and they were in similar situations. So they clicked right away when they met and they were supporting each other and went to trauma therapy and they just, they were really close. And Micah, she met a lot of new friends there and she was getting along with everyone and she was joining so many new groups. She was moving forward with her life and it seemed like she had everything going for her. Micah was just thriving there and she had everything going for her and she was so happy. And when she was texting all her new friends in Kansas, Shailen told me that she actually insisted on texting on Snapchat and I think it's because she was being really, really careful about JP. So she would, yeah, she would use Snapchat and not text messages. 
And it was really interesting because she told me that one day, Micah, she just got up and left. She didn't come and say goodbye to anyone. Not one of them. She just left. And her new friends there, they got a message from Micah saying, it's a miracle. I've been reconciled and my husband is allowing me to come back home. And they all felt it was a bit strange because first of all, Micah, she was moving on and starting a new life. And she still had feelings for JP, but she also knew that this was a very toxic and dangerous relationship and she needed to get out. So they were all wondering why she would go back to him. And another thing they found very strange is that Micah insisted on communicating on Snapchat. But when Micah just got up and left and they got that goodbye message from her, it's a miracle my husband is allowing me to come back home. That was a text message on SMS and Micah had met a new male friend and I have to make it very clear. It was just a friend. It was a church member and they were really, really good friends. He was the only one who got a text message from Micah's phone saying, don't ever contact this phone number again. Never. Do you really think Micah, she would just pick up and leave without saying goodbye to anyone? And do you really think that she would text her friend, her really good friend, a new friend, don't ever contact me on my number again? They all suspect that JP, he came to Kansas and picked up Micah and he took her phone and he was the one sending those messages to her friends and the next message to her new male friend, probably because of jealousy. Because why would Micah be insisting on only communicating on Snapchat and when she picks up and leave, her Snapchat was deleted and her friends there they got messages on SMS, like a normal text message. And Shailen also told me that she wasn't really comfortable by me telling you this to begin with. But now she told me I can tell you everything. So that's what I'm doing. She told me that she didn't have any proof. She can't prove this. But she is convinced that she has seen JP in Kansas. She doesn't remember where but she is convinced that she had seen him there. So is it possible that JP, he followed her there or he tracked her down? He picked up Micah and brought her back home. I, 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 oh, there's no proof at all. But like I said to Shailen, any friend of Micah, any good friend of Micah Miller, I would trust 100%. I don't think any of her friends or family would make up things to make themselves more interesting or to create more drama because they all have the same goal and that's justice for Micah. So when Shailen says, I am convinced I saw JP in Kansas, I have no doubt in my mind that she saw him. He was there. Even though there's no proof, I, I trust her instincts. And when she say that she is absolutely sure that she saw him there, she just don't remember where. I believe her. I really do. The next thing that I want to mention is that I'm working day and night on some theories, some suspects, and it's taking time. It takes time. When you want quality out of a video and it's not just a story or guessing, it really takes time and it's a lot of hard work. So that's why my video might be a bit late, but I want to let you know what I'm working on. And I want to make it very, very clear that I don't have proof yet. I am not stating this as a fact. I'm just letting you know what I'm working on. And if you guys already have the answer, please let me know in the comment section because 
my first few videos have been focused on Micah um, in the pawn shop and in the gas station. I didn't really put my focus uh, at the state park and the people there and what happened there. My focus was in the pawn shop and the gas station. But now I moved my focus to the state park. So I'm working on that area now. So some of the things that I'm going to mention might have been mentioned before by other YouTubers. But I've just been watching the interviews, all the interviews with the fishermen. I heard the 911 calls from the kayak man, from Micah. And I've just been watching and reading everything I can see. And there's, there's just some things that stuck out to me that I want to mention. And like I said, I'm not stating anything as a fact. It's just some things that I find very strange and I'm working on it and I can be completely wrong. Completely wrong. I just heard some things that that made me go, hmm. And it's very complicated and it can be very confusing. But I hope that you get what I mean. So, what I want to mention is that the fisherman he said that he was on the river, he heard a faint cry, and then he heard a gunshot, and the gunshot was coming from the left side. And then he mentioned a boat coming in to the river with three people inside. It was a man, probably the man's daughter, and a family friend. It was two men and one woman. And then he mentioned a man in a kayak. No names, no nothing. It's just a man in a kayak. He doesn't really mention where the man in the kayak came from. He's just there. So this fisherman, he heard the gunshot and he was freaking out and he was terrified and he was really nervous and he really didn't want to go in there because he had no idea what had happened in there, if there were bad guys in there or if someone unalived themselves because the crying stopped after the gunshot. But something, and that's one of the things I'm working on, something made him go in there anyway. Even though he was terrified, he decided to go in there in his canoe. And when he came in there, he felt like something was wrong. He felt something was really off and he was looking around everywhere. But he didn't see anything. Nothing. He didn't see anything. The only thing he saw was Micah's belongings on the riverbank about two feet from the water. And he took her belongings and put them in his boat. And he, he went back out uh, on the river or the lake. He went back out from the area where he found her belongings. And when he came back out in his canoe, the man in the kayak was nowhere to be seen. He said, I looked left, I looked right, and he wasn't there. I didn't see him. But at some point, law enforcement arrives, and this man in the kayak, he backtracks back to the fisherman, and he says, Johnny, you just passed her in your boat. And I'm like, how would you know that if you were not in there where Micah allegedly unalived herself? You must have been in there to be able to tell the fisherman that he just passed her in his boat. And the fisherman heard the faint cry, heard the gunshot, and he was just there. He didn't move. Probably he stayed there for a minute or two before he went in. But if anyone went in there before him, he would have seen it. So how does the man in the kayak know that the fisherman just passed Micah's body? And he also says that his kayak hit a piece of wood in the water. And that piece of wood hit Micah and made one of her feet come out of the water. When exactly was that man in the kayak 
in that area where Micah allegedly on a live herself. I want to know. And the next thing I'm working on is that Micah called 911 at 2.54 p.m. Law enforcement arrived to the park about 3.15 p.m. I think. And I think they found Micah's body after about a half an hour or something. So maybe 3.45, maybe 4 o'clock. They found her body. But at 4.23, this man known as a kayaker calls 911. One hour after law enforcement arrived to the park to tell the 911 dispatcher that he just found a body in the water. County 911, what's the address of your emergency? Uh, I'm sorry, your phone is breaking up very bad. I can't hear you. Is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, I'm in Princess Anne State Park. Uh -huh. And I just made contact with a deputy. Um, I, I didn't get his name. Um, I think I just found a body in the water down there. If you know which deputy is here, if you can tell me back to where he, he just talked to the guy, um, white male, orange t-shirt, in a kayak, he'll, um, he'll know where I'm at. Okay, hold on one second for me, okay? Okay. He doesn't ID himself. He doesn't... He doesn't mention his name even once. Why is he calling 911 undercover? Why is he not revealing his identity? He tells the dispatcher that he found a body in the water. He also tells them that he just spoke to a deputy and there was a man, a white man in a kayak wearing an orange t-shirt and this man would know where to find him. Where are you going? There has been a suicide or possibly a murder and you could be a witness. So where are you going? Why is he leaving when law enforcement is there? And another thing is the fisherman clearly said several times there was a boat with three people. There was a man in a kayak and that's it. So we have the fisherman, a boat with three people, man in a kayak. So where did the second kayak come from? Because the man that called 911 is known to be a kayaker. He is, people are talking about him like he's a guy in a kayak. But in the 911 call, he talks about another guy in a kayak. Is it possible he's talking about himself? And there's not two men in a kayak. Do you follow me? There's only one kayak. There's only one boat with three people inside. But the man calling 911 is also a kayaker. So where did he come from? Is it the same man that spoke to the fisherman? And I also find it very, very strange that the man that's known to be a kayaker that called 911. He might be talking about the fisherman, but he doesn't reveal his identity. Why doesn't he say, I spoke to a guy there and uh, his name is Johnny. You can just talk to him. He have all Micah's belongings in his boat. And it's like he's keeping his identity a secret. Why is he doing that? And it's the same the other way around. The fisherman has been talking about the man in the kayak so many times in all his interviews. He's referring to him as the man in the kayak. But why is he keeping his identity a secret? Maybe you can say he doesn't know him, but it's very clear that they know each other because when the, when the fisherman did an interview, he explained that the man in the kayak, he backtracked back to the fisherman and he said, Johnny, you just passed her body in the water. How would he know his name is Johnny if they don't know each other? So they are keeping each other's identity a secret. The man in the kayak is not revealing anything about the fisherman, not his name, 
He didn't say he had Micah's belongings. He didn't say anything. He just said there's a man there. Maybe it's a second kayaker. I don't know. Maybe Johnny, the fisherman, was wearing an orange t-shirt that day. We don't know. But they're definitely keeping each other's identity a secret, even though they know each other. And the reason I think it's very strange is because the fisherman has been talking about that man in the kayak so many times. Did you ever hear him slip up and reveal his identity? Not even once. He never slipped up. He always refers to him as the man in the kayak. But the very first time he talks about his really, really good friend, Charles, he slips up like that. Whoops, I probably shouldn't have mentioned his name. Am I the only one finding that very strange? He's been talking about that man in the kayak so many times. And in several interviews, he never revealed his identity even once. He just referred to him as the man in the kayak, and he even told him, you're just a kid. So that means that he would be a lot younger than the fisherman, but never ever a name. But the very first time, he talks about his really good friend, like they're really close. He says, I called my good friend Charles. Oops, I probably shouldn't have mentioned his name. <laughs> Isn't that strange? I find it very strange. I don't know. I, <laughs> I think there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle missing here and we are missing something. There's something we're missing. And I have to say, I have been listening to those interviews over and over and over and I know some people are going to hate me now because when you put your focus on one person as a suspect, you just, you can get stuck there. And no matter what this person does, it's just guilty. Guilty. Why did he say that? Why did he move like that? Why did he look like that? Ooh, he made a phone call. I wonder who he was calling. Maybe he's a accomplice. Do you know what I mean? But after I've been looking into this and I suspected the fisherman as well. I will be honest. I really did. But I think, I'm not sure. I think I might have to give him an apology. But I'm going to wait a bit until I'm sure. Because I have a feeling that... That fisherman, he had nothing to do with this. But I'm also starting to think. I don't know. Do you think it's possible that he was set up to take the fall for everything? Because everybody in that area, they know each other. And if something bad did happen to Micah and other people were involved, the fisherman could actually have been very close to the area and they could be terrified that he's a witness and maybe he is a witness and he's terrified to come forward because you don't see any interview with the three people in the boat and the man in the kayak did you hear anything from him he didn't come forward nobody who was there came forward except for the fishermen they're letting him take the fall for everything and he is nervous, like really nervous, and there's a reason he keeps talking. Maybe it's to keep the focus on him. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm not. But if you really take a step back and go back to being objective and just listen to every word the fisherman says, he messes up sometimes, but that doesn't mean he's guilty. It could mean that he is scared, he's terrified, and yeah, he said, I didn't do this. Do what? If this was an alleged suicide, what are you referring to? What didn't you do? I didn't do this. Okay, so you didn't do this, so do you know who did? I don't know. I'm working on it. 
I am working on it. And like I said, I could be completely wrong. It just doesn't make sense that a lot of identities are being kept a secret and then other identities are being revealed like that. Not careful at all. I, th I think there's something else going on here and I'm working on a theory that maybe the fisherman was set up. They took advantage of the situation that he was already there and he already messed up by taking Micah's belongings. So it was very convenient for them to let, let the fisherman take the fall for everything. I don't know. Yeah, the fisherman, he went back to the landing with Micah's belongings inside his boat. Can you imagine being in a situation you're stuck in the middle where you have no idea if someone just unalived themselves or someone actually got murdered and you heard the gunshot, you heard the crying. Can you imagine how he feels inside? He... He messed up when he took Micah's belongings, but maybe there's a reason he took them. Maybe he wanted to keep the evidence of preventing other people to steal them. So he didn't know why he took them. He just took them. Maybe it was to keep them safe until law enforcement arrived. And yeah, he left the park to buy a lighter because he's a smoker and he was really, really nervous. And... Smokers, people who smoke cigarettes, they smoke 10 times as much in stressful situations. And if this fisherman was out of his mind nervous and he was terrified, he probably needed five packets of cigarettes. And I, I get that, I really do. Because if this guy had something to hide, he wouldn't have returned to the state park and he went direct to the police and said, Hey, do you know Amica Miller? Because I have her belongings. Do you think he would do that if he was guilty? I'm, I don't know. I just think there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that doesn't make sense. So can we take a step back and be objective again? And... Take another listen to the fisherman and just listen to what he's saying without judgment. And then let's see how many of you still think that he did this. I don't know. I, I, like I said, I could be really wrong. Maybe he is guilty as sin. Maybe he's not. I'm just trying to keep an open mind and my gut feeling is just telling me that I have to believe him. He didn't do this, but I think he knows who did and he is terrified. Terrified. So think about it. Is it possible that the fisherman, he was set up to take the fall for everything? That's horrible. Another thing is that I can explain as well is that the fisherman called his friend Charles and asked him to look in his phone to see when he called him the first time because the fisherman had deleted all his uh, calls on his phone and all alarm bells went off on everybody that was very suspicious and I get that it is very strange but I actually know a few people in my normal everyday life that does the same. When they get a text message and they have a conversation with someone over text or a phone call, as soon as they put down the phone, they delete the whole history of texts and calls. They're just cleaning up their phone. And in the beginning, I was the same. I was like, are you hiding something from your wife or your boyfriend or whatever? Why are you deleting everything? It's really strange because... You can ask me about something that happened in 2010 and I'll say, give me five minutes, let me check my phone because I have everything. I don't delete anything. I have all my text messages on SMS, Messenger, uh, everywhere. I have everything for maybe the last 15 years. I never delete anything. But keep in mind that some people do. And I, like I said, know people 
every time they finish a conversation on SMS or they make a phone call or receive a phone call, they clear the history of everything and that doesn't mean that they have something to hide. They're just cleaning up their phone. Some people are like that. So I just I just wanted to throw that out there. So I'm really sorry if I'm stepping on someone's toes. I'm just trying to stay objective and not attack someone without solid proof. And I feel horrible for this fisherman if he is in fact innocent because everyone is attacking him and he feels like he's in danger and if he didn't do anything, can you imagine how he's feeling? I don't know. I, I'm just I'm just gonna go with my gut feeling and maybe I'm gonna find out more things that makes him guilty as sin. But I could also find things that would clear him completely and maybe he was set up. So let's keep digging and find out the truth. Let's find out the truth, but just try, just try to take a step back and go back to being objective about the fisherman and just listen, just listen. And the last thing I want to mention is that a lot of you told me that the man in the black clothes in the pawn shop, it looks a lot like JP's son, Logan. And we all know he's been arrested. And I've been looking at the footage and it looks like when the guy walks into the pawn shop that he's trying to hide his face. Or maybe he's just scratching his face. We don't know, but I recorded it because I wanted to show you. And I actually have a picture of his face. And you can tell me if you think it looks like uh, JP's son. Because to be honest, I don't think so. But he has a very specific way of walking. And I found a video of JP's son not walking, but he's not really running, running. But I recorded that as well. And you let me know what you think. Do you think that this is JP's son? I, I, I don't know, but if you look at the guy in the black clothes in the pawn shop, look at his pants. He's full of paint on his pants. There's white uh, paint everywhere on his black pants. And I've been looking for that white van that he's driving. And while I was looking into everything, I found out that JP's son Logan, he owns a painting company. Is that just a coincidence? And this guy entering the pawn shop is full of paint. So if it's not JP's son Logan, could it be one of his employees? I don't know. I just find it very funny that the guy in the pawn shop has paint everywhere on his pants. And everyone says that he looked like JP's son. And then when you look at JP's son, Logan, he owns a painting company. I don't know. Tell me what you think. So that's it for today's video and I am going to keep working and digging and working and digging and I'm going to let you know when I have an update. So until the next one, take care and stay safe. Bye!